الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعاله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله we are continuing with our discussions on Imam Nawawi's collection of 40 hadiths we looked at hadith number six which dealt with matters of halal and haram and the unclear matters that fall between the two and how all of this relates to matters of the heart, how they impact the heart, and how the heart in turn impacts these matters. Insha'Allah, today we will look at Hadith 7 of the Imam's collection. And this Hadith discusses matters of nasiha, of sincere concern. This Hadith has been narrated by Sayyidina Tamim ibn Aus ad-Dari, who was from Palestine and who was a Christian monk before he became a Muslim. Sayyidina Tamim was a devoted monk and he was known for his lengthy and devotional worship amongst his people, amongst the Christians of Palestine. He has the distinction of narrating 18 hadiths from the Prophet wasallam, and one of the most distinguished hadiths which he narrated was the one which was concerned with matters relating to the Dajjal. This was an extremely comprehensive hadith, and these matters, these events concerning the Dajjal were related by Sayyidina Tamim, and then they were related to the people from the Prophet Sallallahu member by the Prophet himself, thus giving it the authentication that the events required. Sayyidina Tamim was known for his worship, for his tahajjud prayers, for his recitation of the Quran. He would complete the full Quran in one rakah. And we are told that people who, in the days of Jahiliya, who are not Muslims, the good qualities that they had in them, when they came into Islam, they brought these qualities with them. So Sayyidina Tamim, as a Christian, was a devoted worshiper. And when he became a Muslim, alhamdulillah, his worship became even more avid and more intense. Sayyidina Tamim died in the 40th year of the Hijra, and he died in Palestine. It is said that after the martyrdom of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Tamim emigrated to Sham, and that is where he passed away. Inshallah, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables us to follow in the illustrious footsteps of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ameen. To proceed on the authority of Abu Ruqayya, Tamim ibn Aus ad-Dari, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet, may the blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, said, religion is sincerity. We said, to whom? He said, to Allah and his book and his messenger and to the leaders of the Muslims and their common people. And this has been related by Muslim. According to Imam Al-Harith Al-Muhasibi, who is known as the surgeon of hearts in the spiritual sciences, writing in his book, Adab al-Nufus, the proper manners of the self, the Imam tells us that this is the most comprehensive hadith it deals with the ultimate purposes and the aims of the believer of the Muslim, and that it also shows us the path of the virtuous people, the path of the, of the people that we are supposed to be emulating, the people that we are supposed to be following. So what does this hadith tells, tell us? It tells us, ad-dinu nasiha. Linguistically, the word nasiha means good advice. This is one of the most common usages of the word linguistically. It means good advice. However, in the context of this hadith, we have to go to the root meaning of this word, the root meaning of the word nasiha, and the root meaning is sincere concern. So this is having sincere concern towards people or towards things, and how we manifest this concern, how it is shown in our dealings, whether it is our dealings with people, whether it is our dealings with concepts and ideas. 
this is akin to a parent having concern uh, for a child, for example. So you have a mother or, or a father being holistically concerned with their child, being concerned for the good of their child in everything, in everything that relates to the child's life. So this is the religious side of the, of, of, uh, the child's life. This is to do with the academic aspect. This is to do with nutrition. This is to do with ta'adib, uh, with, with adab of bringing the child up because a parent has a complete concern about how a child should come up and how a child should be successful in this world and in the akhirah. So this is the implication of the word nasiha in this hadith. Ibn Hajar al-Haythami, who is one of the best known Shafi jurists, tells us that the hadith starts with ad nasiha. So there is the definite article the, ad It's not dinu, ad So we are talking about the deen, ad nasiha. So the deen is nasiha. So the imam tells us that this does not refer to a component of deen or to a part of deen. That the entire deen, the deen in its totality is nasiha. So in actual fact, the deen or religion is nothing but sincerity or sincere concern. Coming to the explanation, the ulema tell us, in this sentence, ad dinu nasiha, ad din is the subject, and nasiha is the affirmation for that subject. For example, we might say, this ball or the ball is red. So the subject is the ball, and red is the color that is an affirmation of that uh, ball. So this, this is the, the relationship between Deen and Nasiha. Now, in order to define the relationship or in order to understand this relationship more closely, we need to be able to define the two terms. We need to be able to define the subject and the affirmation. So what is Deen and what is Nasiha? And the ulema tell us that the Deen is how you relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that has been established, approved, and accepted by the Lord himself. So that is our relationship between us and, and our Lord. And Nasiha, according to uh, Imam Ibn Hajar, is made up of two components. It is made up of Ikhlas, which is sincerity, and it is made up of Atasfiya, which is purifying. So if we put these two components together, sincerity and purifying, it is being sincere. Nasiha is being sincere in our concern for the conduct that we have with other people and with other things. And that in this conduct, in this sincere conduct, we are purifying our speech, our mannerisms from all ill motive, from all ill intent, and from all lack of concern. So in this hadith, we have to be careful that the meaning of nasiha goes to its root, which is sincere concern. Proceeding uh, in, in, in the hadith terminology, once the Prophet ﷺ said this deen is uh, nasiha, ad dinu nasiha, the Sahaba asked to whom? ad dinu nasiha, kulna liman, to whom? So this shows an aspect of the Sahaba that they were always enthusiastic about learning the deen, about learning its correct interpretation so that they could apply it in their own lives. So the Prophet ﷺ replied to them, kala lillahi. Prophet ﷺ said to Allah. And here, the ulema tell us that it is to seek good in our relationship with Allah through our belief, through our submission, and through our status with Him. Regarding belief, unfortunately, in today's world, we have a group of Muslims who have gone into an idea, or who are delving into an idea of a different concept of spirituality. They say that our belief is something which is personal between us and our Lord, and that it is something which does not have to be dependent on other things or on other actions or on other qualities. However, in the Quran, we have been informed that salvation is not only dependent on belief, but that salvation has to, combine, has to be combined with action and with practice. So in several places in the Quran, we have been informed that people who believe and who work righteous deeds 
for them is paradise or for them are gardens beneath which rivers flow. If we subscribe to a religion, if we have accepted that we are Muslims and that we have brought belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is logical that we follow the precepts, we follow the principles that he has laid down for us. It is not up to us to decide how we are going to relate to him. And if we really submit ourselves in Islam, then we have to, apart from the submission, apart from the belief, we have to work righteous actions, we have to work righteous deeds, we have to be taking part in the matters of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us, which is our relationship with him, as well as the mu'amalat, our relationship with other people as well, with fellow Muslims and with non-Muslims also. So it is not for us to decide how we are going to relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To give ourselves up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is nasiha with Allah. That is our sincere concern with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ulama tell us that whatever we do in regards to Allah, in regards to our belief, in regards to our submission, everything comes back and benefits us because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from any needs from his creation. Further, we are informed, walikitabihi. So there is sincere concern for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And regarding this, we should know that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something, the Quran is the speech of Allah, it is not his creation. It is something that came to us through revelation, through wahi by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is something that cannot be copied, we cannot have another book like it. And that we have to then be in a position where we recite it humbly and we carry out a reflection on it, the dabbarun, and that we learn and apply its meanings and we defend it against those who are misrepresenting it. There is a clique of people, uh, unfortunately some of whom are Muslims and non-Muslims as well, who are interpreting the Quran according to their whims. So what we have to keep in mind is that the Quran deals with a lot of complex issues around legal matters, around moral matters, around metaphysical matters, and all these matters are dealt with in the Quran through an interpretative tradition that we have in Islam. There are multifaceted ways in which the Quran addresses these issues. So it is not for us to read a cluster of words on a page and claim that what is being presented is in plain text. Regarding the Quran, it talks about itself as having Passages that are muhkam, or clear in meaning, and those that are mutashabih, meaning they are symbolical and they are ambiguous. So it is for the ulema, for the people who are involved in the sciences of the Quran, to be able to tell us this. Otherwise, we will be going into areas of misinterpretation, and in that lies a great danger for us in our deen. Proceeding with the hadith, it tells us, wali rasulihi. So, we have to have nasiha towards the Prophet Sallallahu And the ulama tell us that this is to cultivate ta'adim, which is veneration, and mahabba, which is love. And these really are foundational aspects of our belief. We need to have these two aspects. If we have ta'adim, when we venerate his sunnah, when we venerate his ways, when we do it with passion and we do it knowing that we will get close to him and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this becomes something which is a, a functional part of our life. Also, we have to have love for him in order to strengthen our belief. And this love for him then goes, to, goes on to translate into us doing what he has commanded us to do and staying away from what he has prohibited. Like was mentioned earlier, in the Quran, we are told, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُدُوهُ And take what the messenger has brought you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, is commanding us to take what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has brought for us in this deen. And the love then also extends, the love that we have for the Prophet extends towards his family and towards his companions as well. To conclude then, the hadith goes on to say, Wala immatil muslimina. Wali aimmatil muslimina. And towards the rulers 
or towards the leaders or towards the imams of the Muslim community. And the ulama tell us that the, that the leaders can be divided into two. So there are the political leaders and there are the religious leaders. And we have to show nasiha, we have to show sincere concern to both these groups. As far as political leaders are concerned, we are supposed to stand up to them if they are on the wrong. However, the way in which we do this is very critical. All the Sunni schools of uh, Akida, all the texts in those schools forbid us from armed revolt against our leaders. So if you find a leader going on the wrong path, it is your duty to correct that person with good advice, not by armed revolt. Because the danger with armed, armed revolt is that it opens up the doors to fitna and instability. And once these doors to fitna are opened up, they are very difficult to close. And unfortunately, this is something that we are witnessing in a lot of Muslim lands around us today. And the Prophet wasallam informed us that the greatest jihad is speaking a word of truth in front of a tyrannical ruler. So the whole concept is that we have to have nasiha towards the, the, the leaders in a way which encompasses the proper qualities of what nasiha means. And as far as our concern for religious leaders is concerned, we are supposed to support them, to help them, to aid them in all their matters in which they are promoting our deen. So for example, in matters like da'wah. So do all the best that you can in order to help them promote these issues. And finally, we are told, wa وَعَمَّتِهِمْ وَعَمَّتِهِمْ That means to nasiha towards the common folk or towards the common people. There are five rights that a Muslim has towards a fellow Muslim. And that is to return his greeting, to accept his invitation when he invites him, to go and visit him when he is sick, to accompany his funeral when he dies, and to give prayers upon him when he sneezes. And the hadith concludes with وَعَمَّتِهِمْ And the common folk or the common people. We are told that a Muslim has five rights upon another Muslim. To reply his greeting, to accept his invitation, to visit him when he is sick, to accompany his funeral, and to send prayers upon him when he sneezes and praises Allah. So when a Muslim sneezes and says, Alhamdulillah, you reply to that, Ya Allah, may Allah have mercy upon you. So this is showing sincere concern to your fellow Muslim. Also, we need to be able to guide our people towards the good. What is the benefit of a community where an individual who is on the wrong path is not being guided by his fellow Muslims? This is a question we need to ask ourselves. We should have sincere concern towards other Muslims by assisting them in word and deed, in covering their mistakes so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in turn covers our mistakes, and in warding off harm towards them in whatever means and form that harm comes to them. Inshallah, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to have sincere concern, to have nasiha towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards his book, towards his messenger, towards our leaders, and towards the common people in our ummah. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Hmm.